What would it be like to live in mankind's first colony in space? Earth 2, a Fusion Patrol review. Earth 2 is a true speculative look at what a future space colony might look like, what ideals its people might espouse, and how it might interact politically with the Earth below. This potential pilot movie, released in 1971, stars Gary Lockwood, Scott Highlands, and Harry Rhodes as the command crew that originally founded Earth 2, and guest stars Tony Franciosa and Marriott Hartley as the newcomers Frank and Lisa Carger. The central premise of this story is that Earth 2 is an independent nation, orbiting Earth with full United Nations membership. Earth 2 is dedicated to peace. They eschew all forms of weapons, even banning children's toy guns, although not apparently a toy P-38 Lightning bristling with guns. They're also governed by a system of direct democracy in which all 2,100 citizens of Earth 2 participate in discussion and direct voting on all major policy issues. The drama begins when two things happen. The first is that Frank Carger and his family, new immigrant citizens of Earth 2, arrive Frank was instrumental in getting Earth-2 into orbit, but he didn't support it being an independent country, and he still doesn't support its strict, pacifist ways. The second is that the Red Chinese place an illegal nuclear weapon in stationary orbit directly above Moscow. Earth-2 comes within 150 miles of the weapon on each orbit. It is a dangerous incursion of nuclear weapons in their backyard. Tampering with a bomb would be an act of war. Leaving it there would be a direct threat to the lives of everyone on Earth, too. With Frank Carger stirring up the population and agitating for taking direct action, can Earth, too, survive? This film appears to be very much inspired by the almost hyper-realism of space exploration in Kubrick's much-vaunted work, 2001 A Space Odyssey. It's clear that the filmmakers are attempting to create a realistic portrayal of what life in space might be like. The film touches on such both complexities and advantages of zero gravity, and even the nature of orbital mechanics is integral to the plot. Now, to say that the visual effects of 2001 A Space Odyssey were unparalleled in their day is almost an understatement. Earth 2, however, operating on a 1970s TV movie budget, can only crudely ape Douglas Trumbull's Academy Award-winning visual effects, but it doesn't really detract from the story. There are only a few laughably bad visual effect moments. Earth 2 is commonly confused with Gene Roddenberry's contemporary pilots Genesis 2 and Planet Earth for a variety of reasons, including the time they were made and the similarities of names. But not only is Earth 2 completely unrelated, it predates both Roddenberry efforts and it's just much better science fiction. While Roddenberry used his tried-and-true Star Trek formula, presenting us with an ideal society of what we could be, and then using alien civilizations and cultures as metaphors for the problems that present society needs to address, Earth 2 goes a more direct route. Earth 2 explores the complications of people trying to build an ideal society while challenged by the very real shortcomings of humans who may fall short of those ideals. Honestly, I'm quite surprised that this isn't a cult hit amongst Trek haters who think that the Trekverse is too lily white. The movie looks at three major political areas in the framework of a new utopian space policy. The first being simply that what does it mean to be a pacifist society? How far must you go to remain pacifist? And at what point must you act to preserve those ideals? The second deals with nuclear weaponry, and in no subtle way creates a Cuban Missile Crisis parallel situation, which brings the world to the brink of nuclear war. For me, however, the most interesting piece of the program is their system of democracy. I find what they're trying to portray fascinating, but it raises so many questions that are not explored that I left the movie feeling unfulfilled and eager to see a second episode so that we could explore them more. As we know, that second episode never came, so let me touch upon a few of those issues here. Earth 2 presents a system called a D&D, &D, or Discussion and Decision, that can be called by any citizen if they wish to challenge or establish a policy position. The citizen speaks on behalf of the initiative. Another citizen, presumably a spokesperson for the established station administration, speaks in opposition. Like a trial, 
Witnesses and experts can be called by either side, and a small, random population of citizens acts as a discussion panel. The discussions are held on the open video channel, and all citizens are encouraged to watch and then, immediately after the discussion, vote the issue up or down. Decisions are final and based on simple majority rule. Imagine if we had a democracy in which all citizens were engaged and involved, or that whole swaths of our population weren't marginalized or ignorant of the issues. In this movie, we see that 92% of Earth 2's voters participated. Where is that other 8% though? Clearly voting is not mandatory, nor is anyone given time to make up their vote if they don't participate when the event is live. In the one vote we see, the margin is so slim that those 8% could easily have swayed the vote to a substantial win for either side. All citizens of Earth 2 are immigrants from the nations of Earth. We know this because at the end of the episode, Earth 2's very first native citizen is born. We also know that the population of voting adults is approximately 2,100 people. We can reasonably expect a population of motivated immigrants, all living in a tight-knit small community, will all be politically active, especially since one of the hallmarks of Earth 2 is this experiment in democracy. How well will this system work in 40 years when the second generation of Earth 2-ians are in ascendancy? Will they be as active, or will they become complacent like voters in more mature democracies? Will the population of Earth 2 be forever constrained, or will it continue to grow as they build the station larger and larger? Will a D&D work when the population is 5,000? 10,000? 100,000? One of the questions that came to my mind is, with voting occurring immediately after the discussion, what if one of the speakers is an inordinately persuasive orator, while the other is less so? I could see this as a similar problem to one we have here in the United States with trials by jury. Appointed public defenders are simply not as likely to be prepared or as polished as a paid defense attorney. It is a system where justice can be dispensed on your ability to pay for a quality attorney. Would not a similar thing happen here? The person making the case will have a vested interest in bringing it forward for a D&D, but could they enlist a persuasive speaker to put their case? Who speaks against it? It would seem a D&D is mostly a challenge to the existing station administration. Would an efficient and effective administrator end up being this society's equivalent to a public defender? What if the citizens don't feel like they got enough information to vote immediately? What recourse have they got? Are those missing 8% abstentions? Then there's the question, what if the facts being presented are just false? Perhaps because I currently live in a country where, on a daily basis, leaders in power tell us black is white and have no regrets and no apologies for lying straight out of their asses, that I find this is the single most fascinating concept in the movie. We have some hints of the answers in the movie. Keen-eyed viewers may have noticed that during the D&D, on the video feed, to the population, subtitles were being added to the discussion, evaluating not just the facts themselves, but the logical validity of the arguments being presented. What a revelation that would be if everything that was said by our modern politicians was processed and vetted in this way. But of course, it raises more questions, like, who writes those notations, and how are they verified? In Earth 2, I believe we're given enough information to conclude that the notations are generated by a computer. Later in the movie, Carger is preparing for a second D&D, and he mentions that he's run all his arguments through the computer, and his logic is perfect. If the computer can confirm the validity of a logical argument and the facts contained therein, is there a point to having the citizens vote at all? If we reduce politics to facts and valid logical arguments, is there one version of the truth that will prevail? What if the population votes entirely contrary to the evidence presented by the computer? These are all unanswered questions. The concept is immensely interesting, and I, I hope someday there's a whole genre for science fiction democracy. Now here's one from the poor timing department. The main baddies in this film are the Red Chinese, which refers specifically to the citizens of the People's Republic of China, or the PRC. At the time this was filmed, the PRC was fully in control of mainland China, but they were not recognized by the United Nations as the legitimate government of China. 
The Republic of China, or Taiwan as we now almost universally call it, were not the Red Chinese. However, during the course of this movie, the names are used interchangeably. No doubt to the chagrin of the Chinese on both sides of the Civil War. Just a month before it was aired, though, the UN switched recognition of the government of China to the PRC. To be clear, the Republic of China were not the baddies in this film, and are completely independent of and have never been part of the People's Republic of China. Hashtag suck it, 50 Cent Army. Earth 2 is a thoughtful and interesting film in the vein of 2001 A Space Odyssey, hampered somewhat by primitive visual effects and production values. If you want to watch big screen Academy Award winning special effects, I recommend watching 2001 A Space Odyssey. But if you want to engage a part of your brain other than the sleep center, give Earth 2 a chance.